Aloha and welcome to my home. My name is Kimo and I'll be sharing with you my best 20 DIYs of 2020. So let's dive right in. And for this project, we have a few supplies here that I got from Dollar Tree, including that Let It Snow sign and also some paint sticks from Home Depot. I'm using some of that pink spackle again to make sure that we fill in that hole on the let it snow sign and setting that aside now we're going to assemble our paint sticks together. Now you can see that I have a little straight edge to make sure that the sticks themselves are straight and I have a couple of pieces that I've cut out that are going to attach to those sticks. Now you can see here that I'm just using hot glue to assemble this together, which I would recommend if you're using raw wood. Once you paint the wood or once you stain it, it gets a little tricky and sometimes the hot glue doesn't hold. So I'm doing this step first now and then I'm going to add some stain a little bit later. Now because hot glue doesn't stick very well to paint painted surfaces or stained surfaces, you can see here that I'm adding little bits of wood to the top there, which will actually help to hold our sign in place, which I'll show you in a future step. I'm using a dark wood stain to stain both the front and the back of our sign here, but you can see that I'm careful not to stain those little tiny wood pieces at the top that we just added. To camouflage that hole, I decided to add a little bit of snow to the sign. And I'm just adding a little bit to the tops there as if the snow has fallen down on the sign. And here I'm just using some white latex paint for this effect. After our wood stain has dried, we're gonna flip that over and we're going to add some twine. Now on the twine itself, I decided to braid it so that it could be a little bit thicker and stronger. And we're going to use this piece to create a hanging apparatus for this particular project. I braided more twine and we're using some of those little cute wooden cutout snowflakes from Dollar Tree and we're going to attach this to the back as well. After hot gluing all of those twine pieces to the back of our project, now I'm going to use some black felt to make sure that those twine pieces are really securely fastened down with the hot glue. So I just cut out some of those felt pieces there. You can see me adding some hot glue to each of the twine ends and we're going to cover that hot glue with these pieces of felt. Now we're gonna add that let it snow sign to the top of our project using some hot glue. And you can see here that those wooden pieces are exposed just as we had planned, which is going to help this sign to stay on our project a bit better. And using my friend's Instagram photos of her family, I've shrunk down some images to about two inches by two inches, and we're using some clothes pins to hang them to our project. And here's our final result. I just love the neutral tones on this project, which really makes those photos come to life. This video is part of a collaboration with Heidi Sonball DIY and Leah Nepp from DIY Beauty on Purpose. I've got links to their channels in my description box below, as well as a link to the playlist where you'll find the videos from all the other makers who are also participating in this collaboration. So please go and check them out, show them some love and support, and let them know that Chemocraft sent ya. 
For the second DIY project, we'll be creating a sign. I have four of these really cool uh, frames from Dollar Tree, and we're also going to be using some craft sticks to put it all together. Now for this sign, I decided to go with a staggered look to give it a little bit more interest. On the backs of the frames, that's where I'll use some glue, some hot glue, and I'm going to secure those frames into place using half of a craft stick. Now I picked up four of these frames because the word or, or the name that I'm using has four letters in it, uh, but certainly you can use more or less frames to create a sign with however many letters are required. Instead of words, you can also uh, attach some photos or maybe some inspirational sayings or pictures on there as well. But for this project, we are going to use the word or the name Stan, my husband's name. Now for this next part, I'm putting on my finger rubber, which is my little finger protector. That's what I like to call it anyway. And I'm going to add um, some rope so that we can hang this sign. You can see that I'm adding some hot glue on one end, attaching the rope there and pressing down with my little finger protector. And then I'm going to add more hot glue on top of that and add a piece of felt just to give a little bit more reinforcement and I'm pressing down until that glue dries completely and then we'll be doing the same thing on the other end of the sign. Now to create our letters and for that I have some scrap pieces of paper and also some sheet music that I've already cut into little squares that will fit on each of the frames. I'm going to draw out, just sort of freehand, the letters here using a thick sharpie so that I can cut those letters and we can attach them to the frames. Now I'm cutting out each of those letters and next step is to add a little bit of uh, an outline to each of the letters using some craft paint and my little dabber sponge here. I'm also going to do the same thing to each of the four pieces of scrap paper and then you'll see next that I'm going to put the letters onto each of those pieces of paper and the outline really helps the letters to stand out and gives it sort of an aged effect. Now once that's done, all we need to do now is to attach each of those letters onto the clips to create our name. And here's our final result. If you're liking what you see so far in this video, please remember to like this video, subscribe to my channel, and hit that bell to get notified every time I upload a new video to my channel, and let me know in a comment down below which of these projects is your favorite. Luminary out of a photo and a vase. The vase itself comes from Dollar Tree and I'm going to use vellum paper for this project. Now vellum paper is a kind of paper that is semi-transparent and this particular vellum paper is six inches by six inches and it has a subtle pattern on each of the pages. Now I printed up a photo on regular copy paper and I'm going to take our vellum, which again is six inches by six inches, and I'm going to carefully tape that vellum onto the photocopied image. I'm taping the edge of the vellum that will feed into the printer. So I've got a couple of images ready to go with the vellum already taped on there. I'm going to insert them into my printer and print it up. Mm -hmm. 
After your printer has done its work, you can slowly and carefully remove that vellum from our photocopy paper. Now I'm going to take these images and with some double-sided tape, simply apply them to our Dollar Tree vase. By applying two of these images to the vase, there will be a little bit of overlap in the images themselves, so I'm trying to minimize that seam as much as possible. I also decided to add a border to our photos, kind of like a frame. So I'm using a very thin black ribbon to create a border on the top and the bottom of our vase. I hope you're enjoying these projects so far. Let me know in a comment down below which of these five DIY holiday projects is your favorite. I love this project because it's so simple and yet so effective. Now we're just gonna add in a little flameless votive candle light to watch our luminary glow. And here is our final result. I am really loving this snowy, subtle pattern in the vellum paper, which just really creates this wintry effect. And this is the brass votive candle holders from the Pottery Barn website. And I'm gonna take these plastic skulls that I got from Dollar Tree and with a Sharpie, outline the areas that need to be cut out. So you can see that I'm outlining the eye sockets, the sides of the mouth, as well as the back where we will insert that candle. To cut open the eyes and the other areas, I decided to use an X-Acto knife and I'm just cutting away at those eyes. And one little tip here, I noticed that for these skulls, there are parts of the skull that are a lot thinner than others. For the eyes, for example, the eyes were uh, pretty thin, the areas around the eyes, so that uh, those parts were easy to cut out. Uh, same thing on the back, but when I got to certain areas, I did notice that the plastic was thicker. Once those areas are cut out, I'm gonna use some leftover white primer paint, some latex paint to paint a coat of paint on both the inside and the outside of these skulls. And you can see that I'm not being totally careful. Um, there is a lot of texture on these brass votive candle holders on the Pottery Barn website. And so I don't mind uh, if I'm laying on that paint pretty thick. Once the paint has dried, I'm going to add a little bit of texture using this spackling paste. Now this is a paste that goes on pink and it'll dry uh, in a white color. And you can see that I'm just smearing it on, adding some texture and some height in various places on the skull. Now, instead of brass, I really love the color copper and I have some copper metallic uh, spray paint left over. So now we're just gonna take those skulls that have that spackled texture on them and we're gonna give it a couple of coats of this beautiful spray paint. And here is our result. I'm calling this first one a loose crumple with rubber bands. Now on all of our face masks, there's definitely a front side and a back side. So be aware of that when you are applying your design. Now on this mask, we're simply going to crumple up the fabric and secure it with a couple of rubber bands. But I'm calling it a loose crumple because you don't want to make this too tight. You don't want to turn it into a tight ball. If you do, you risk the chance of not having that dye uh, seep into the areas that you want. So I say loose crumple is better. That way you have a better distribution of the dye. But you can see it's pretty simple. Just takes me a few seconds to do.
Now, just a couple of notes about our RIT dye bath. First, I let the mask soak for only about seven or eight minutes tops. Next, as you can see me wringing out uh, as much of the dye as possible, I also left the clothespins, the rubber bands, and the thread on there as I put these masks into the RIT fixative solution. I found that that way you have less of a chance of all the colors bleeding in together. And here's our result for the loose crumple technique. Not much time and a really great effect. For our second mask, we're gonna do horizontal accordion folds and add clothespins to add a very interesting and unique design. Now here on the mask, there are already some natural parallel folds that occur on the mask. And I'm just gonna play around with that a little bit to turn it into an accordion fold, which we will then secure into place with four clothespins. Now, I would discourage you from using too many clothespins because you want a little bit of space between those clothespins to allow the dye to seep into the fabric. If you have too many clothespins in a row, it creates a resistance where the dye can't really go into those folded areas. So I found that four clothespins is a pretty good number. I love the way just simple folds and resistance on the fabric can create some really cool and unique designs. And here's our final result. I just really love the way that this one turned out. Okay, this next one is super fun. I'm using a mason jar and rubber bands to create our pattern. For this technique, we want to place that mask on top of the mason jar using those rubber bands to hold everything down. But the rubber bands not only secure everything in place, they also lend to the actual design. Now make sure that the outside of the mask is facing outward on that mason jar. Now you can put as few or as many rubber bands as you would like. Just remember that each rubber band represents a line that will cut across your mask. And here's our final result. I absolutely love this one. Now I'm calling this final method stitching and gathering. And the idea here is that we're going to stitch sort of an oval or diamond pattern around the mask and a smaller one inside of it. So I'm gonna take a needle and thread and start stitching semi-circles. Now you wanna stitch a semi-circle uh, versus an entire oval around the mask. And that is because at some point in time, you want to pull on that string to start gathering the fabric. And that gathering is what is going to create our pattern. Out of the four different masks that I'm showing you today, this one for me is the one that uh, was a bit of an experiment. I hadn't tried this technique before of stitching and gathering. So I'm keeping this stitching pretty simple and basic. So here you can see that I've basically created four semicircles and the threads are hanging out on the side. It's time to gather up the fabric by pulling on the thread and kind of pushing down on the fabric. And once that's done, then I'll simply tie the ends to make sure that everything is in place prior to dipping this mask into the dye bath. Now this is a technique that I'd like to work on a little bit more. I think there's a lot of possibilities there. But here's our final result. And you can see that it almost looks like teeth surrounding that mask. But I think that in the future, I wanna work with this in a little bit more to explore the possibilities. Using this gift box that comes from Dollar Tree. I just love the shape of it in a little house. And yes, it is made out of cardboard, but it is so well constructed and so cute. I knew that I could do something really fabulous with this. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm gonna give this gift box a little bit of a whitewash using some paint. And I'm using a dry brush technique because I don't wanna saturate this gift box because after all, it is made out of cardboard. 
Whether you're making these projects for yourself or especially for a friend, I find that social media like Instagram and Facebook are great sources for photos. Who knew that your Facebook stocking habit would actually come in handy for these crafts? After painting both the top and bottom of that gift box and setting it aside to dry, I'm going to cut up some of the photos that I retrieved from my friend's Facebook account. Kim had these great photos um, from a long time ago of her and her kids, and so I decided to make them black and white in PowerPoint, and I formatted the pictures to the exact size that I needed them to be on our gift box. And you can see here that I'm going to be decoupaging all of those photos onto our little house using some decoupage glue. Now you can probably see why I decided to paint this gift box white before applying the photos. I wanted to create a nice, simple, white canvas-like background, and I also wanted to be sure that none of the design of the original gift box showed through the actual photos. You can also see here that I'm using my fingers to smooth out those photos as much as possible. Once the decoupage glue has dried, I'm now going to apply some red acrylic craft paint to two sections of the house to make it pop and make it look a little bit more like a barn. I'm going to add a couple of snowflake embellishments to our house as well. And first I'm going to cover up that hole with some spackle that turns white when it dries. After the spackle has dried, I'm going to paint both of the snowflakes in a white acrylic paint to make sure that the paint is uniform. I'm using some hot glue to attach those snowflakes to both sides of our little photo gift box house. And after that, I'm going to fill it with some gifts that we prepared for Kim. First, I'm going to lay in a couple of sheets of tissue paper, and then we'll incorporate the other gifts that we have, which include some ginger lavender tea, some local organic honey, a tea strainer, and a lemon. After putting our gift together, here's our final result. I really hope Kim loves this gift as much as I loved making it for her. I just love these little gold wire baskets, but we need to cut a little space at the top to allow for that pull light to come through. So I'm using some cutters to cut open that hole at the top of our pendant light. And I decided to keep this gold color, its original color from the Dollar Tree, because I think it looks really cool and really modern. Now in this step, I'm creating a base so that we can have something for the pull light to attach to and also to just sort of anchor everything together. So I have these four wooden discs. They're about three inches in diameter and I'm simply gluing them together. If you don't have discs like this, you might want to look at some scrap wood or maybe even some coasters. Uh, just something to allow you to, again, provide a bit of a base onto our pendant lamp. Once our wood discs have dried, we need to just drill a hole right down the middle. That hole is where we'll thread our cord for our pull light. There are a few rough edges on the piece and so I'm going to sand uh, some of that down with my sanding sponge here and that'll get it ready for our next step, which is to apply black acrylic paint. 
I like using black here for this piece because it'll make it very modern and uh, be a nice complement to the gold. Now aside from the stacked discs that we glued together earlier, I also set aside some single discs that I'm also painting black and you'll notice that they also have a drill hole in the middle of them. And now we're going to start assembling everything together. I'm putting some hot glue on the bottom of that wire basket and I'm going to press it down onto our stack of discs. Once that's dried, I'm going to add E6000 glue and also some hot glue onto the bottom of our pendant lamp here, and then add that single disc on top of it. I'm laying that glue on pretty thick so it has a chance to really gel between both sets of discs. Once dried, our base is complete. I'm really liking these pull lights. So simple to use, you just have to pull on that light to turn it on and off. At the end of the core, the opposite end, you'll see that there's this little device here which is actually a clamp and it's used to make sure that the end of this cord uh, doesn't fray. With the clamp off, it's easy to thread that cord right through the pendant lamp base. To hold our pull light into place securely, I'm going to add some E6000 glue followed by some hot glue. To finish off the look of our pendant light, I'm going to add back on this top piece. Even though it has no functional use for our lamp, I do like the way that it just finishes the look. Now in our home, I've decided that we're going to put this set of pendant lamps right over our little bar cart that we've got in the corner of our living room. And I think it's going to look fantastic. But I think you could put this just about anywhere. You could put it into your bedroom, a space in your living room. Heck, you could even take it outside if you want to. After all, it is portable. Maybe put it in, put it in the garage or maybe in your RV. I think there are so many uses for it because it is portable. There's quite a bit of slack at the end of our pull cord lights, and so I decided to use that to our advantage here. I used a slip knot to create um, a space where we can actually hook on our pendant lights onto a hook, and then I'm wrapping the rest of those cords down the length of the, the lamp, and I'm gonna secure it not with glue, not with hot glue, I'm gonna secure it with some black thread. That will give me the ability to disassemble it later if I want to, or maybe rearrange it in some way. That way it's just not permanent. And here is the final result for our portable basket pendant lamps. Can you believe this only cost me about 20 bucks total? These are a set of photo coasters that are made from these little tiles that I got from Home Depot. Now these are free flooring tiles and what I love about them is that they come in a variety of colors but they are all the same square shape which is perfect to make our coasters. I'm going to take a series of four images and cut them up so that they'll fit perfectly onto each of our coasters.
Using some decoupage glue, I'm going to apply a thin layer of decoupage to the backs of each of the photos themselves, as well as to the surface of the tiles. After laying down the photo, you also want to apply more decoupage glue to the tops of the coasters for added protection. I'm using here a glossy clear coat to not only provide some shine, but also protection to these coasters. And after applying a couple of coats to our coasters, here is our final result. I love these coasters because you can display your favorite photos just about anywhere. Your good memories should last all year long. So I've got this really fantastic wrapping paper that I haven't used and it just has this lovely turquoise color with this gold print on it and so I'm going to use this wrapping paper as our background and I'm simply going to decoupage it in strips onto our canvas making sure that we get around the edges as you can see here. Decoupage glue needs to go on both sides of the paper and of course, we need to finish off on the other end. And we're going to repeat this several times as we achieve a solid background. Now, we didn't have to rip it. We could have put an entire sheet down, if you will. But I wanted to give the piece some dimension. So I decided to rip the wrapping paper instead to give it some subtle texture. My goal is to cover the entire canvas so none of the white is peeking through. And we're almost there. I'm just decoupaging the final couple of pieces onto our canvas and then after that's done, we're going to let it dry completely for the next step. So while our decoupaged canvas is drying, it's time to choose some papers that will form the image of the bulldog. I'm ripping out a page from my songbook, and that will be the foundation of our image. And here's where our carbon paper comes to the rescue. I put the carbon paper black side down onto the page of music and the image on top. And that way I'm able to simply trace the outline of our bulldog image directly onto the page of music. Now, let's cut out the outline that forms the bulldog image. It's looking great, and this will be the first layer of our bulldog collage. Now it's time to trace out other sections of our image that we will layer on top of the first. After carefully cutting out each section, it's good to put it on the original image just to see how it fits. 
So now we have a bunch of sections already cut out and we're ready to layer them on our canvas. You can see that I've put a number on the back of each section to help me remember where each section goes. Now we decoupage each section onto our canvas, starting with our first layer, which of course is the page of music. After that dries, we're going to use carbon paper again to trace out where each section goes. Using our lines as a guide, now we simply start to layer on the different sections onto the canvas. For some reason, I just love using my fingers to smooth out any wrinkles. I'm painting on one last layer of decoupage glue all over our bulldog image. And after letting that dry yet again, I'm using our photocopied image as a guide to simply add some texture and some outlines onto our image with a Sharpie. This is where you can get really artistic. The lines that I'm adding really add a textural and sketched quality to our image. And don't forget to sign your name. The snow globe came from Dollar Tree, and the other things I'm using came from my craft stash. I've got some embellishments, some silver leaves there, as well as this tiny butterfly that I once used for a previous project. I have some pale pink nail polish from Dollar Tree also on hand that I'm going to use to give the butterfly a more pale pink color. So I'm going to brush a couple of coats on the butterfly uh, on the wings, both on the top of the wings as well as on the bottom of the wings. I'm going to set that butterfly aside to let it fully dry and we're going to pay some attention to our snow globe here. Now I wanted to add a wintry effect to this snow globe and so we're going to take the bottom or the lid of the snow globe and first what we're going to do is to attach some of these silver leaves that I have in my craft stash. Next, using some decoupage glue and a little foam brush, I'm going to apply that glue to the inside of this lid or the bottom of our snow globe to make sure that we have um, full coverage of the Epsom salt snow on the bottom of our snow globe. I'm also going to apply some of that decoupage glued to the inside bottom of our snow globe. That way, some of the Epsom salt will stick to the sides of our snow globe and create that wintry effect. Now I'm going to attach our cute little pink butterfly using some hot glue.
Now with the glue still wet, I'm going to add a few handfuls of this Epsom salt into the snow globe itself. And then we're going to get that lid and put it back on. And once the lid is back on securely, we'll shake that snow globe so the Epsom salt snow can go to everywhere where there is some decoupage glue. As a final touch, I'm gonna to take some thin, pale pink ribbon and attach it to the bottom of our snow globe with some hot glue. And with everything in place, here is our final result for our pale pink butterfly snow globe. This snow globe is giving me some really beautiful, wintry, vintage vibes. This is a pretty plain wooden frame from the Dollar Tree, uh, but we're gonna really jazz this thing up. First, we are removing that heart-shaped photo, which we'll use later as a template, and then we're going to apply a coat of white craft paint to the entire front surface. Don't forget to paint the inside of the heart as well as the edges of the frame. We'll set that aside to dry, and once that's dried, we'll get our decoupage glue, some parchment paper, which will act as a non-stick surface, of course our frame, and our tissue paper. We're going to add a layer of decoupage glue to the front of the frame, but be careful not to paint the inside of that heart or the edges of the frame. I'm laying down that tissue paper and I'm going to slowly and carefully place that frame on top of the tissue paper. For decoupage glue, you can use Mod Podge or other brands, but in a pinch or if you want a less expensive option, you can always use some white school glue watered down with a bit of water. Now I'm putting a final coat of decoupage glue over the entire surface and using my fingers to define the edges of the frame as well as the edges of the heart. After letting that dry again, we're going to now remove all of the excess tissue paper, starting with the inside of the heart. And I'm using a utility knife to carefully cut away that paper and then removing it by hand. I'm also going to remove the excess on the sides of the frame with the utility knife again. We're also going to use a nail file to really sand down any of those tiny leftover pieces of tissue paper on the edges. You can choose to finish this off with either some clear coat or maybe you can paint the edges of the frame just to give it a more finished look. Here is the frame I got at the thrift store for $8, and it's a really well-constructed frame. The only challenge we have is really on the sides of the frame. You can see that the foil, which is uh, just kind of a paper foil that they put on top of the frame, is starting to bubble up all along the edges. So we're going to open the frame up to see what's there. This is kind of always the scary part for me because you never know what lurks beneath, um, but I'm taking off the hardware as well as uh, that paper covering to see what we are working with underneath. 
So when I pop up this square cardboard piece that is the backing, um, I can see that uh, the rest of the contents are in there. I'm just shaking them out of that frame. Now, the contents include this piece of glass, which I'm actually not going to use for this project because it doesn't require it. And we get down to the art, which is uh, taped to this mat. I'm going to take that piece off and you can see that I have here revealed an MDF, MDF square frame that I'm cleaning up as well. That square frame is going to come in handy to maintain the depth in our shadow box. Going back to the sides of the frame, what I need to do is to scrape off those raised parts. And once I got to scraping, I began to understand that this is going to be a bigger project than I had intended. Um, the foil is coming off in pieces and I want to make sure as much as possible we can remove that so that the frame itself becomes very smooth. After scraping off as much of that foil as I can, I used a sander to help me um, smoothen it down a little bit more, both on the edges as well as on the front of the frame. And here, I'm using a little bit of spackling to really smooth out those edges of the frame. Uh, this is a spackle that is put on pink, and then when it dries, it turns white. Once the spackling has dried, I very, very carefully uh, begin to sand some of that down using a very fine grit sandpaper. This is actually a little sander that I have that works great. And I've cut out a piece of burlap that I'm going to attach to that cardboard square that we initially took off of the frame using a little bit of spray adhesive. This burlap fabric is going to provide a little bit of texture and will be a nice backdrop to the different texture that we see in the sea fan coral. And back to the frame. We're going to paint this frame black so that uh, it really mimics the restoration hardware version. And this is also going to produce a really nice contrast to the white of the sea foam coral. I'm adding some paint as well to the burlap that we just uh, adhered to that square piece of cardboard that is the backing of this frame. And it's taking quite a bit of paint here, and it's just a shade or two lighter than the shade of the frame. I'm also adding some paint to this square MDF piece that goes in the frame. This piece is uh, the thing that helps to really create that shadow box effect and I'm painting on the inside as well as on top of that frame so that it blends in very well. Because the coral fan is bigger than the frame that I have, I'm just marking off with some Sharpie how far down I have to cut. And I am going to give this uh, coral piece a little bit of a trim. So starting out with um, what the shape uh, is in order to fit in the frame, I'm now going to fine tune a little bit of this trim to make sure that it looks as natural as I can get it. After giving the coral a bit of a trim, now I'm going to add some clear coat to both this burlap backing as well as the frame. To mount the coral to the cardboard backing, I'm going to use just some simple pins. I'm poking in a hole in the coral, which is just made out of a plastic. And after I put those pins in, I'm going to poke them through the cardboard um, backing to make sure that they are fixed and mounted and won't fall off of this backing. I placed three pins through the coral and now you can see here that I'm centering everything on that cardboard backing and I'm pushing those pins through and I'm going to secure them on the other side of that cardboard. 
My technique here is that I'm placing down some hot glue right on that pin and using some of that scrap material from the burlap, I'm going to just press down on the other side and gluing that piece of burlap into place for some extra security. And now it's just a matter of assembling everything back together. I'm gonna to use some hot glue for the inside edge of this frame, and then I'm going to simply start layering back in all the things that need to go into this piece. I'll put the square piece of MDF back into place. I'll also put the, the next layer, which is going to be that burlap, and I'm gonna finish it off with some butcher paper on the backing, and I'm putting that hardware back on to the frame. And after doing a few touch-ups here and there, here is our final result. The Restoration Hardware Original is $525, and my dupe cost me about 15 bucks. $4 for the coral, $8 for the frame, and a few bucks in miscellaneous supplies. How do you think I did? So here's a quick supply list. We'll need seven packets of those wood cubes from Dollar Tree, craft paint, craft sticks, wood glue, E6000, and polyurethane for this project. The first thing that I'm gonna do is to simply count up how many cubes we need in each color and start sorting them and separating them into different bowls. Since this is a really precise craft, we need to make sure that we have the right preparation and part of that is making sure that you have the right amount of colors for each coaster. I'm using a cutting mat for this project to create a really nice flat surface and I'm putting some parchment paper over that to make sure that we catch any glue. And to apply our paint, I'm using this old sock that you can see I've used many, many times before. And it's simply a matter now of um, taking the lid off of that craft paint and I'm gonna keep that lid there and put that sock around my finger and tip my finger into that lid. And that helps me to apply that paint to the, um, to the cubes. Now you'll notice that I'm not painting it on with a paintbrush. I'm using the sock to get kind of a, a stain effect. And by that I mean, um, you know, when you put on stain onto a surface, you kind of rub it in and then you wipe it off. And I'm kind of doing that technique here and reapplying paint to make sure that it's as saturated as I need it to be. And here I'm just starting with the yellow. So we're going to paint all the rest of the cubes using this same process. And you can see that I have a ton of cubes. So the coasters themselves are going to be seven cubes across by six cubes down. And so in total for six coasters, we're looking at 252 individual wooden cubes. So yes, it's a lot of painting. And this is truly how we're going to get our pixel art effect. Now using the grid that I created, which tells me uh, which colors need to go uh, in which places on our coasters, I'm going to lay out those cubes of the different colors on top of our ruler, which acts as our straight edge, and start attaching them together using some wood glue. I'm working on each row individually, and once all six of those rows are completed, I'll attach them all together using some E6000 glue. I'm showing you here the process that I've done for a few of those coasters, and you can see that those colors really work here. Uh, the Super Mario image itself has primarily primary colors, the red, yellow, and blue, and I added that green because I thought it would make a nice sort of pop in the background. 
Now the cubes themselves as they are, are probably not going to stick together long term. So I decided to put a backing on the coasters and craft sticks was my material of choice. These craft sticks come from Dollar Tree and you can see that I'm cutting off the ends of all the craft sticks, but I'm going to measure them to make sure that they'll have a perfect fit on the back of those coasters. Now you may have noticed in this tutorial that I have not used a hot glue gun and that's because I don't think that the hot glue is going to work long term for these coasters. So I wanted glue that was a bit more industrial. So I've decided to use the wood glue to attach the cubes together but I'm also going to use E6000 to attach those rows of cubes together as well as to attach the craft sticks to the backs of our coasters for added reinforcement. Now for me is the fun part where we get to attach those rows of cubes together and you can start to see an image forming. But I think that's only because I know an image is there. Otherwise, if you didn't know that these were actual puzzle pieces to a coaster, you may not even realize that there is a bigger or larger image that's being formed. I like using the craft sticks here because they are wood, first of all, and so they're going to mimic the overall kind of wooden effect that you'll get from the sides of the coasters, which you have noticed that I've left unpainted. Um, and the craft sticks are cheap, they're easy to use, they fit perfectly to the backs of these coasters, and I really couldn't be more pleased with that solution. I love these little wooden cubes that you get from Dollar Tree. I've used them a lot for other projects as well. But one thing to remember is that these cubes are not all the exact same size. There is some variation which will affect the way that these coasters come out. But I don't mind that the coasters are chunky and there's a little bit of variety in there. It makes for a really beautiful handcrafted look. Now I'm going to use some polyurethane to make sure that we have a good coating on all sides of our coasters and our secret ingredient is canned corn today. Just kidding. I'm using those cans of corn to help me prop up those coasters to make the polyurethane application a little bit easier. Here I'm applying a fast drying polyurethane to all sides of our coasters and I love the way that the polyurethane really brings out the wood grain as well as adding a nice protective surface to our coasters. I applied three coats of polyurethane letting it dry between each application. Look at those fun colors. After letting everything dry completely, here is our final result. Today our project basically consists of two different parts. We'll be working on the fall house as well as the fall branch and leaves that will go into our house that will kind of act as a vase. So here are some items from the Dollar Tree that we purchased for this project. We have those wood arrow signs and some wood planks that come in a pack and I'll be taking off the rope and the labels of course off of our wood signs and I'll be painting them in an acrylic white paint. I would consider this project a modern, minimal farmhouse project. Uh, I'm gonna keep it pretty simple with the color and really let the textures be the feature of this particular DIY project. 
After painting the front, the back, and all the sides of those wood pieces, I'm going to set that aside to dry and make room to work on our fall leaves. You can see that I'm using some orange cardstock and this wonderful set of metallic watercolors. It's kind of my new obsession. <laughs> I have some water on hand and what I'm going to do is to moisten my brush with some water and dip it into the fall colors on this color palette. So for the fall colors, I'm focusing mostly on the darker red, uh, the orange and the yellow. And you can see that I'm just kind of dabbing some paint on there randomly to create some random patterns. I'm starting with the darker paint first, so the darker red, and then once that's done, I'm going to move on to the lighter colors, the orange and the and finishing off with this beautiful metallic gold. I'm going to make sure that we have both sides of our cardstock painted because the leaves should be visible from both sides and so there should be a pattern or a color on all sides of those leaves. This effect is just stunning. I love how all the colors blend well together, but there is definitely a shine and a pop of color on both sides of this paper that will really make our piece so beautiful. I'm going to set that cardstock aside to dry and it will need to dry for at least a couple of hours because we've saturated both sides with that watercolor paint. But setting that aside, we're now going to focus on assembling or constructing our house vase or vase cover. Now for the assembly, we're going to use those little tower blocks that you get from the Dollar Tree and that will help to uh, attach all of our sides together and basically form a rectangular box. You can see here that I put some hot glue on that tower block and I'm carefully setting it in place, leaving enough space on the sides to attach the wood planks. I've attached four tower blocks to each of those house sections, and now I'm gonna add some hot glue to the tower blocks to add the wood planks to the sides. With the side planks attached to one of the houses, we now need to make sure that we create a box and attach them to the other piece of that house. And voila, it worked. We now have a structure that we can put our vase and our branches into. Next, we're gonna use some clothespins to create a roof line on our box and we're gonna paint those in a brown color and I'm fast forwarding ahead here to actually gluing those clothespins onto the ridge of our roof. And this will add a little bit of texture and in my opinion gives it a little bit of a Swiss house kind of effect. Now to give this more of a farmhouse look, I've got some twine that we're going to wrap to the bottom third or so of our structure. Now back to our autumn leaves. You can see here that our cardstock has completely dried on both sides. And this is where I'm going to start creating our leaves. Starting with a fold, and that fold there is going to represent the middle of our leaves, which we will cut out with a pair of scissors. I'm cutting out leaves um, just sort of freehand here, and so I've got some larger leaves, some medium-sized leaves, and some smaller leaves, but just look at how beautiful and shimmering that they came out. I have a bunch here that I'm now going to be attaching to our branch. 
I found this branch in my backyard and you can see that I'm just giving it a bit of a trim with some scissors and I'm also kind of readjusting one piece. I've uh, broken that branch off and I'm uh, kind of reattaching it with some hot glue and some twine to make sure that it stays in place. I'm gonna use a hot glue gun to attach these leaves individually onto the branch, starting with the larger leaves nearer to the bottom or the base of our branch. And then as we get higher, I'm gonna use leaves that are slightly smaller, but you can see how beautiful these leaves are and how good they look attached to our branch. I purchased this bud vase from Dollar Tree, and you can see that it's thin enough and long enough that it fits perfectly into our house structure. But I'm gonna weigh it down a little bit with some rocks, and the rocks will also help the branch to stay in place so that it doesn't move around a whole lot. I decided to create a little mini wreath using some of those twigs that I cut off as I was trimming the branch, and I cut out some little mini fall leaves from our leftover cardstock. Now we're going to start putting some finishing touches on our piece and I decided to do a little bit of a dry brush um, technique on the, on the clothespins on the roof ridge to give it a little bit more of a farmhouse look and I'm adding our mini wreath to both sides of our vase. So everything seems to be coming together pretty beautifully at the moment. And here is our final result. So for this project, we're going to be making a frame out of some pieces of wood and also this plywood. This is called an underlayment plywood. It's used to uh, used for subflooring and we'll also be using some paint, a roller that I, I purchased from the Dollar Tree. I have blown up the actual photo from the Pottery Barn website and that will be my guide as I trace it out onto the plywood. We have this new set for me. It's a wood carving set, comes in a kit like this, and this will be the first time that I'll be using that. So please see that in the link below if you're interested in purchasing that. And one of my secret weapons, I love using carbon paper, and we'll be using carbon paper for this particular piece of wall art to make sure that it looks as close to the original as we can make it. So. We'll start by putting our frame together, and this is where we just get those four pieces of wood. They are made out of poplar and measure 1.5 inches by 0.75 inches. I'm just nailing them together, and then I'm going to attach that underlayment plywood to that frame, putting down some wood glue first, and then nailing down that plywood. Now, the underlayment plywood, as well as the other wood pieces cost in total around $14 or so, about $7 for the plywood and another $7 and something for the wood pieces. So you can see that this is a very economical project for me. Here I'm painting on some white latex paint that was left over from another home project. And I'm using that Dollar Tree paint roller, mini paint roller to uh, paint that on. I took the image right off of the Pottery Barn of that cow skull wall art and I printed it up. It was too big to print up on just one sheet of paper. So you can see here that I am taping that image together because it printed off on multiple sheets. 
And for this project, my secret weapon is carbon paper. Carbon paper you can use over and over again, and in fact, I've used that sheet of carbon paper for multiple projects. I'm simply going to slip that under our image. You can see that I've taped down the image right to the canvas or our plywood using some painter's tape, but just on one side so that I can lift up the image as necessary to move around the carbon paper to a new area. Taking a ballpoint pen, I'm simply going to trace the entire image, including sections that need to be chiseled away. And introducing my new wood carving set. This is a set of 12 different tools uh, that are used for different kinds of carving. Now I am a complete novice when it comes to wood carving, so there was definitely a learning curve, but I decided to treat the carving much as I would a simple drawing. I'm starting with an outline first around the entire image and outlining certain sections within the image that either need a bit more detail or that uh, I can prepare to be chiseled away. I pretty much stuck to just two of the tools. One was a V-shaped tool that gave a very thin line, and the other was a U-shaped tool that was just a step above the previous one that helped me to chisel away larger sections of our image. I have an image of the Pottery Barn cow skull wall art on hand as a reference just to make sure that I'm chiseling away where I need to. Here I'm lightly sanding the surface of our cow skull wall art and then I'm going to spray on a non-gloss clear coat. And here's our final result. And here's a side-by-side -side comparison of our Pottery Barn dupe. The original on the Pottery Barn website goes for $499, and my version cost me about $15 or so. How do you think I did? Today's decoupage project is a simple round cardboard box that you can find at the Dollar Tree. It's always amazing to me the kinds of things you can find for just a dollar. We're going to start by painting this box white with some craft paint, making sure that we get inside the lid as well as outside both the box and the lid. We want to make sure that everything is covered with white paint. Once everything is painted white, we'll just set it aside to dry before our next step. After our box has had a chance to dry, I'm pulling out some parchment paper which will make a really nice non-stick surface and this is the tissue paper that we'll be using for today's project. It's a tissue paper with some cool colorful robots on it. I've cut out a section on this tissue paper that will fit right around our box. You can see that I'm applying some decoupaged glue to the box and carefully setting that box down on our strip of tissue paper that we've just cut out. Our tissue paper is thin enough that we don't need to actually apply any decoupage glue to the tissue paper, but we do have to ensure that there is a nice coat of decoupage glue on the box itself so that the tissue paper will cover the side of the box. That's why this parchment paper comes in super handy because you don't want any of this project actually sticking to your table. As we continue to roll this box, you can see that there is a bit of overhang on the paper on the top and the bottom of the box. In our next step, after everything dries, I'll show you how we remove that excess paper. Now we're going to cut out a section of tissue paper to fit on top of our cardboard lid. 
And it's a very similar process. We're going to apply decoupage glue to the top of the lid and then put that piece of tissue paper right on top and then add another layer of decoupage glue. You can see that I love using my fingers for this project and on the lid in particular, it's helpful to run your finger around the edge so that you can get some definition on the edge of that lid. Now after that's dried, we need to remove the excess paper, which we'll do with a nail file. You can see that I'm running the nail file along that edge of the lid, and as I do so, that tissue paper will start to fall away. I'm going to do the same thing for the box. The nail file acts like a little mini sander and I find that it's just perfect for decoupage projects. Now be careful because this is a cardboard box, you might start to sand away some of the cardboard. You can always touch it up a little bit later, but be gentle with this phase. I decided to add a little lime green to the edge of that lid to give it some definition and a pop of color. Here I'm just using some lime green craft paint and using a dabber sponge brush. And after letting that dry and adding a clear coat, this is our final result. So for this project, we're going to need a Harry Potter book, and I've already taken the liberty of ripping out a few pages from that book. And with those pages, we're going to create a backdrop to our piece of art. You can see here that I'm decoupaging each page very carefully onto that canvas. This is the perfect kind of project when you're trying to upcycle or recycle um, failed canvas art because essentially you end up covering it all up and starting afresh with a new canvas. Which is exactly what I did here. I let that stand for about three or four hours to just let it dry completely. And while that's drying, we can work on another part of this project, which is a really, really important piece. I'm using carbon paper here to trace out certain sections from this portrait that will turn into our collage. I printed out my inspiration piece from Etsy and I'm going to tape those pieces together and that will form the stencil for this piece. back to our old friend carbon paper and we're going to use the carbon paper to help us trace out these sections um, that will help to form the pieces on our collage. I'm going to start here with uh, Harry's robe uh, which is front and center. I'm simply going to trace out his robe using the carbon paper and that will trace out the design onto my paper of choice. You can see the outline that we've just created using the carbon paper, and now I'm going to cut out that shape using a pair of scissors. Now we're going to do this for all of the individual pieces on this portrait, and I like to just kind of line it up to the original to make sure that it is the right size. You can see here that I'm cutting out another piece, this time it's Harry's hair. And it's a good idea with so many pieces floating around to write down on the back what piece that is and who it belongs to in the portrait, just to keep everything organized. Our canvas with our decoupaged pages is completely dry and now we can move on to assembling this collage. We're going to go back to our carbon paper to help us draw the outline of the three figures that will help us to set that foundation uh, as we begin to build our collage. But before we actually start gluing any pieces together on our collage, 
I saw an opportunity to add a little bit of color to the canvas and so I took out my watercolor set and almost with a dry brush technique uh, carefully picked colors of the galaxy dark blue a bright pink and also added in some yellow since uh, that is a part of the Gryffindor colors to create this backdrop and just to be safe, I added a clear coat on top of the canvas to make sure that the watercolor wouldn't be reactivated in our next step as we were collaging. Speaking of collaging, you can use decoupage glue, but a lot of times I'll just use a combination of white school glue and a little bit of water. Um, I find that this works just as well as decoupage glue in most cases and on most surfaces. Here I'm starting to work on Ron Weasley's portrait first. I've set his pieces aside and assembled them ahead of time just to make sure I knew how they were going to line up and in what order they needed to be glued down. For all three figures, I determined that it would be best to put the face down and then the cloak and build the other pieces on top of those foundation pieces. You can see here that the beautiful painted effect on the paper is actually working really well with the actual watercolor painted parts on this canvas. And yes, I'm using my fingers to iron out any wrinkles. Now, it's not going to be completely wrinkle free because when we glued down the pages of the book, we already created some wrinkles there on purpose to create some texture and dimension. We just have a few pieces left on our collage and it is turning out so great. I love this overall sort of sinewy, painted, abstract effect that's a running theme throughout this piece. But we can't forget our boys glasses so as one of our final tasks here i am getting our carbon paper back out and we're going to draw on those glasses and then follow up by using a fine sharpie to really make those glasses pop I sprayed on a gloss coat to protect the piece and here is our final result. We're boiling up some water and placing our wine corks in that boiling water for about 10 minutes to soften them up. That'll make it easier to slice them in half. And I found that the easiest way to slice them is to place my fingers on either side of the cork and slice right down the middle. It's best to do this while the wine corks are still plump and wet. So I think the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to take some bright yellow craft paint and we're going to paint the inside of the frame, including the base of the frame, but also on the inside of the frame. So what I'm doing is taking the sock, I'm just going to dab it into the paint. Thank you. And I'm going to take it and then just rub it on the top because it doesn't have to be completely covered as far as that you can't see any of the cork coming out. That's it. So we've got a couple of different corks here. We've got some champagne corks, and we also have the regular wine corks that we've actually cut in half, as you've seen. Uh, and we're going to use the champagne corks as the center of our cir circular patterns that we're going to have uh, in a few places on the base of this frame. 
So we're just going to get to gluing and I've got my E6000 glue here as well as a glue gun. We're going to use both to get things kicked off. So first we're going to put our champagne wine cork that we've painted pink on there. It looks really cool. Thanks Stan. Mm -hmm. And we're going to adhere that first somewhere on our frame. Okay, let's see how this goes. And also I've been painting pink and orange beside pink and blue besides the yellow cork top. So I'm just putting some E6000 glue in the center of that cork, but I'm going to surround it with a little bit of hot glue as well. And the combination will help to make it stick now, but also hold in the future. So let's pick a spot. And here we go. I'm just putting it down, putting it down right there. That's our very first cork. And we're going to build around this cork in a circular pattern. Okay, we're going to have that green. Mm -hmm. okay. After just a few circles, I began to realize that the circles were turning out to be more like hexagons, which I was completely okay with because I think that's part of the joy and wonder of crafting is that you never know for sure what that final result is going to look like. So it's important sometimes to let the materials and the process just kind of do their own thing. To fill in any remaining gaps in the piece, I had to cut some of the wine corks to make sure that they fit just perfectly. Because of the seamless design, you can barely even tell which corks we had to cut. And now, the final result. So for our project, I decided to use jars from the thrift store. I could have gotten mason jars from Dollar Tree, but I think that getting a nice variety of different kinds of jars is perfect for this project. But from the Dollar Tree, I did get this glass candlestick that we're going to attach to the bottom of a couple of our jars using E6000 glue. Adding these candlesticks to the bottom of the jars will give it kind of an apothecary jar look as well as elevate these jars to give different levels of height. For best results, let that glue uh, have a chance to cure overnight. Now I got several items from the Dollar Tree that we're gonna put into our specimen jars, starting with this cat toy. Love that little furry tail. And we also have some toys that I got out from the uh, the kids toy section, like that little uh, three-legged three monster and this kind of squishy toy as well. And I'm gonna alter some of these items more than others. For the cat toy, we're simply just gonna tear off the tags and put those in. But for these kids' toys here, I didn't like that big eye in there, and so I'm just taking a Sharpie and adding some black around the Sharpie so that we have sort of some indistingu indistinguishable features. Can't say that word. And the same thing for this one. I'm actually gonna punch or cut a hole into here um, so that we're gonna let some of the air out, but I'm also going to uh, color over those eyes in a black Sharpie as well. So with some of the air deflated, this actually turns out to be one of my favorite items that we put in the specimen jar. During this time of year, Dollar Tree also has some really great Halloween decor, including these uh, skeletons of different animals. I just realized that one of them already doesn't have a head. Oh well. And so I'm going to simply tear off some of these bones, and these little bone pieces are going to go in some of the jars as well. So 
So here we've got lots of bones and skeleton parts to work with. Now I wanted to put together at least one unusual creature, so I decided to make a skeleton mermaid. And I have a few items that are gonna help me to do that from the Dollar Tree. First, these little skeletons, human skeletons, and you can see that I'm clipping off both the arms and the legs. The legs I'm clipping off because it's a mermaid and we don't need those for this particular project, but I also clipped off the arms in order to reposition them. And so you can see I've got some feet that I'm gonna use. <laughs> I'm gonna put those in one of the specimen jars. But going to the whale, I am using a knife to cut off the top portion of that whale, and we're gonna use the bottom portion for our mermaid tail. Now, the tail seemed to be at the right length, but it was way too big to fit in that skeleton. So I'm using a heat gun here to shrink some of that down and a scissors to cut out parts uh, of the tail just so that I can make it fit a little better. Now that the inside of the tail is a little smaller, I'm going to use uh, some hot glue to glue that portion or that skeleton into the tail. Here I'm gluing back on the arms, but in a way that makes a little bit more sense to me if this mermaid is going to be in a jar. Now I don't have a doll or any doll hair on hand, but I did have some purple yarn which I'm going to use to create hair for our mermaid. You can see that I'm wrapping around that yarn on my fingers, almost as if I'm going to make a tassel. You can see here that I'm trying to brush out that yarn. I think it worked pretty well. If I had more patience, probably it would have turned out a little bit better. But I think that for the most part, we have what we need for mermaid hair, and we're gonna glue that on with some hot glue. Now we're gonna make some glow in the dark water to put in our specimen jars. And as a reminder, we're using these highlighters that I got from Dollar Tree. They come three in a pack. And you can see on one end where you normally remove the cap, that's where you use the highlighter. But we're interested in removing the other end of the pen. I'm putting on a glove for this part of the project because we're going to be handling some highlighter juice, <laughs> for lack of a better term. And you can see that that just slid out the other end of our highlighter, and I'm basically going to milk it as much as I can. And when I milk it, this fluorescent liquid comes out into our jar. I'm just gonna add some water to that jar and I just use one highlighter. I'm gonna not quite fill it up all the way so that we have room to put our items into our specimen jar. And look at that awesome glow-in-the-dark juice. It's so cool. I'm going to put some of these insects, these plastic insects that came in a couple of bags from Dollar Tree. And you can see that I just need to kind of fit them in there. I'm going to add a little bit more water to fill that water line to the top. For a couple of our toys that were kind of filled with air like this one was, I put more snips into it and made sure that we got some water inside of the toy so that it could weigh it down. With all of our objects now inside the specimen jars, we need to talk about lighting. In this case, I decided to use some submersible lights that I had left over. And you can see that once those lights go into that jar, man, that glow is so incredible. If you don't have submersible votive candles like this, you can also consider a black light or even some strategically placed votive candles in between the jars. And here is our final result.
And so for the base of this sign, I'm going to be using this cutting board that I got from Goodwill for a couple of bucks. It's made out of bamboo, but you can see that it's really weathered and all the varnish has basically come off. So I'm going to use some really beautiful dark wood stain to create this beautiful base color to work from. I found this doggy sign at Dollar Tree. It's adorable. And I'm painting it a couple of coats uh, with a white paint primer from uh, a paint that I had left over from other projects. But you can certainly use chalk paint here if you have that on hand. And now we're going to dress our dog. And to do that, we're gonna use a pair of mittens that I got from Dollar Tree. And the first thing that we're gonna do is to create a beanie uh, for our dog. And we're gonna do that by cutting away uh, the fingers and just using the bottom portion of uh, one of the mittens. Once the fingers are cut off, I'm gonna turn this inside out and we're gonna gather the top and secure it with a twist tie. Once we're confident that the twist tie has done its job and everything looks secure, we're gonna turn it back around uh, to its original side and just kind of fluff it up a little bit. And you can see here that it does look like a beanie. Now we're gonna move on to making a scarf. So I got the other mitten and we're going to um, cut lengthwise to create a scarf. Now once those longer pieces are cut out, I'm going to fold in the ends and glue them down to create as much length as possible for our scarf. And we actually created two sides of the scarf because the back will go around the dog and will be hidden from view. So you can see here that I'm about to secure those scarf pieces in place. Once we've secured the back with some hot glue, we'll flip it over to the front side and make sure that we uh, add a little bit of hot glue to the front of the scarf to hold it in place. Now it's time to put our little beanie into place. And so I'm adding some hot glue right around that rim where we've folded up the bottom of that beanie. Uh, and then we're gonna add some hot glue to the crown of the dog there and secure the beanie to both the front as well as the back of this dog figure. And for a finishing touch on our beanie, I'm gonna hot glue a little green sparkly pom-pom to the top. Last but not least, we're gonna add a couple of socks to the front paws of our dog figure. And these are just the fingers that I've cut off. We're rolling the tops back and we're gonna slip those socks right onto our little puppy. You can see that this dog figure is really coming together and we're gonna add a little bit of embellishment to the front of that scarf. 
I'll be adding a couple of Dollar Tree tower blocks to the back of our dog figure, and this will help as we mount the dog to the cutting board. Now I'm going to add a little holiday message to our cutting board using a white paint pen. And after adding some hanging hardware to the back of our cutting board, here's our final result. Thank you so much for joining me today. Please remember to like this video, subscribe to my channel, and hit that bell to get notified every time I upload a new video. And wishing you a great, happy 2021.